A lot of people who are interested in brain training and cognitive development will tend to focus on specific aspects, things like concentration, verbal fluency, memory. All that stuff is cool, but to me it's not as interesting as things like creativity, insight, or the ability to see the world in ways that other people don't. Someone who was famously brilliant at this was Albert Einstein. And what's awesome in a very morbid science fiction kind of way is that researchers have been able to look at Einstein's brain to see what made him tick, what made him think the way he did. And by extrapolating from that information, it's possible that we can come up with ways to train ourselves to think a little bit more like Einstein. So one theory about what makes somebody intelligent is that it has to do with global brain connectivity. As the name suggests, this is the notion that you have more connectivity between different areas of your brain. So your brain is separated into different regions and the better these are connected to one another, so the theory goes, the better you should be able to bring together information from disparate areas, different senses, different modes of thinking to come up with something original and unique. It promotes synergy. Promote synergy. According to some theories, you can only ever have intelligence in a specific domain. Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences is along these lines, saying that you can be a genius in movement or a genius in music or maths or English, but it's unlikely to be a genius in all of those things. But by looking at general brain connectivity, you can look at more generalized intelligence and perhaps also things like creativity and, you know, what makes a polymath. But Einstein showed evidence of both these different types of intelligence because he had specific regions of his brain dedicated to logic, maths and spatial intelligence, but he also showed greater synergy between those areas and also more connectivity throughout the brain. And in particular, he had a lot of connectivity between his visual spatial areas and his mathematical reasoning areas, which makes a lot of sense for a guy who thought about physics a lot. So in particular, Einstein had an especially well-developed set of inferior parietal lobes. These are to do with spatial reasoning, but they're also part of the association cortex. The association cortex is a network of brain regions that regulates this synergy between different parts of the brain. So this is a part of the brain that literally takes your visual information and looks at how that relates to other information coming from other parts of your brain. So that, that literally confirms or appears to confirm that theory. And it also is particularly interesting because if we look at Einstein's own words, his description of how he came up with some of his ideas, then he seems to suggest himself that he would visualize them and then he would intuitively understand them. So when he was thinking about traveling at the speed of light, he actually visualized doing it, imagined what that would be like, and then he just knew what that meant and how that pertained to reality, you know, as you do. Okay, so he said, if I pursue a beam of light with a velocity c, velocity of light at a vacuum, I should observe a beam of light as an electromagnetic field at rest, though spatially oscillating. <laughs> Duh. There seems to be no such thing, however, neither on the basis of experience nor according to Maxwell's equations. From the very beginning, it appeared to me intuitively clear that judged from the standpoint of such an observer, everything would have to happen according to the same laws as for an observer who, relative to the Earth, was at rest. For how should the first observer know, or be able to determine, that he is in a state of fast uniform motion? One sees in this paradox the germ of the special relativity theory is already contained. Einstein's inferior parietal lobes weren't just larger and more developed though, they're also oddly shaped. Most of us have got a cleavage, a fissure, between the two hemispheres uh, in this brain region, uh, called the Sylvian fissure. Einstein's Sylvia fission, Sylvian fissure was a different shape and it was less pronounced, meaning that he could communicate between the two sides more efficiently. And he also had a thicker corpus callosum. This would have allowed both hemispheres of the brain, all the regions, to communicate more readily. The corpus callosum is a network of nerves, a kind of band of nerves that literally goes from one side of the brain to the other. This is how you transfer information from one side to the other. Einstein's was thicker and this allowed once again more whole brain kind of thinking. And what's also interesting though is that it seems that some of Einstein's other brain areas suffered as a result of this. Famously, he wasn't as good with words. He didn't learn to speak until he was three. And likewise, there are rumors that he was 
dyslexic or at least somewhat um, less able when it came to spelling, etc. This follows from what we know about brain plasticity. One area grows as you use it more, other areas shrink as you don't use them so much. So that's all very interesting, but what I really want to know is how we can apply this to our own lives and thus think more like Einstein, theoretically. Well, first of all, if you want to think more creatively and if you want to use more whole brain thinking, you need to relax. There's a theory that all ideas are essentially not new, but combinations of old ideas. So to come up with a new idea, you need to think of two different things, combine it in a unique way to create something original. This is one explanation for why global brain connectivity would help you to come up with more novel ideas because you're able to take two different neurons that represent different thoughts, different memories, and then combine them as your brain is spreading out and looking at all these different areas of your brain. In order to achieve that, you want to use what's called the default mode network. This is a network of brain regions that are responsible for daydreaming, forward planning and coming up with unique ideas. This kicks in whenever we engage in a kind of mundane task. For instance, if you go for a walk and find yourself daydreaming and then don't know how you got to the destination, that's because your default mode network has kicked in. Einstein famously worked in a patent office, so the idea here is that he was busy just stamping his patents, letting his body do the work really, whilst his brain was up and away thinking of all these unique and interesting ideas. What you mustn't do if you want to be creative is to be highly focused and stressed. If you're working towards a goal, if you're scared, or if you're just really trying to get work done to deadline, then you enter the fight or flight state, which is the complete opposite of the default mode network. Here, your brain becomes far more honed and focused on a specific brain area, which pertains to what you're doing. When you're running away from a lion, you don't want to be daydreaming about Ooh, what would it be like to be traveling at the speed of light. You want to be just focused on dodging things and running and not looking back. So when you're stressed, when you're working to a deadline, when you're under pressure, your brain becomes more focused and narrow and you become less creative. When you relax and allow your thoughts to just wander, then you can come up with creative new ideas. And I'm not saying you need to work in a patent office, but what I am saying is that maybe go for more walks and schedule some time into your routine to just let your mind wander. Walking is great for this, just don't walk into traffic whilst you're daydreaming. See, I was doing this just now, I was relaxing and eating a Burger King. When you eat, by the way, you produce um, serotonin, which is a feel-good hormone, and this converts to melatonin, a relaxation hormone. The brain goes into that same relaxed state. And I thought, hey, why don't Burger King and McDonald's do like a crossover? Because, you know, when superheroes do a crossover, that's like a massive thing. If McDonald's and Burger King did a crossover, that would be like great marketing. I'd definitely go to McDonald's to try out the, you know, Muck Whopper, wouldn't you? See, that's the kind of idea you have when you're relaxing. It's wasted though. I'm probably not gonna pitch it to either of them. And another thing we can do, maybe, is to try and develop our brains to become more like Einstein's structurally. Brain plasticity describes the ability of our brain to grow and to change shape as we use it. Just like you can train muscles to get bigger by using them, so you can train different areas of your brain to get bigger by using them. So you could even say that it's likely that Einstein's inferior parietal lobes and other brain areas were bigger because he used them more. Because he was thinking about maths and physics, those parts of the brain got larger. And because he wasn't so interested in writing novels, those parts of the brain atrophied. So in theory, just by practicing using those brain areas, you could maybe make them larger and thus think a little bit more like Einstein. So one thing you can do, and something I'm quite interested in, I've written a blog post on it in the past, is train your ability to visualize. This is a useful skill, you know, the ability to bring something to stark relief in front of your mind's eye and to imagine it, to rotate it, and to then manipulate it with your mind. This is a skill that comes in handy in all kinds of different areas, and it's something that you can practice anywhere you are. So if you want to improve your spatial awareness and your visualization skills, that might be one way of doing it. Computer games might also be useful for developing spatial awareness, and some studies do suggest that. If you want to increase the connectivity between the two hemispheres of your brain, then one tried and tested way you can do this is by training ambidexterity. Studies have shown that ambidextrous people have thicker corpus callosums, callosi, callosies, corpus callosumses. And this is because, of course, they're using the two different hemispheres of their brain more when they're writing and doing other things. Once again, I've made posts on this and videos on this. You can train your ambidexterity in a number of ways largely by just using your left hand more to write and do other things like that. And if you want to promote synergy, promote synergy between your different brain regions, 
then another thing you can do is to practice using your uh, visual intelligence alongside your auditory cortex. So for instance, when you're looking around, be more mindful of where the sounds are coming from and what image belongs to what sound. Sounds like nonsense. If you check my video on training your senses like Daredevil, I speak about this in a bit more detail and explain how your senses are more powerful when you use them in unison. Just being more mindful of the complete sensory picture can help you to combine those different senses in your mind. Oh, and interestingly, meditation has also been shown to increase general brain connectivity and to even boost the amount of gray matter you have in important regions. So that's another thing you can use to strengthen your brain and develop it. And of course, practicing maths could also be useful. And whilst you're training these different skills, you also want to improve your brain's plasticity. You can actually increase how plastic your brain is and how malleable it is at any given time. Certain supplements and nutrients can do this. For instance, magnesium three and eight can increase plasticity according to some studies, as can lion's mane mushroom or Valpro 8, although I don't recommend that latter one. More interesting though is simply the fact that when you're learning, your brain becomes awash with chemicals like BDNF, that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, dopamine, all of which promote further brain plasticity. And this is why our brains are so plastic as children. You see a lot of people think that children are so great at learning things, picking up languages, learning to walk, etc., because of some kind of genetic switch that turns off when they reach a certain age. You know, kids can pick up new languages, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, etc. My interpretation of that though is that children, their brains are so plastic and so malleable because they're learning so much. If you think what it's like to be a child, everything is new, everything is fresh. They're learning to use their senses for the first time, they're learning to walk, to move around. You know, every single thing is a lesson, they're learning to interact with people. Everything is new, it's all new stimuli and the brain has to learn in order to survive. It has to learn fast and a lot. And so this is what causes the brain to become more plastic. And as you learn, there's less new stuff to learn. And so you begin to settle and produce fewer of those chemicals. Your brain becomes less plastic, but it's nothing special about the child's brain. It's just the fact that they are subject to so many new things. And studies show that even later on in adulthood, when you're learning a new subject or exposed to novel stimuli, you do produce more of those neurochemicals like the BDNF. So imagine if you could surround yourself with that much novel stimuli, your brain would become so plastic and then you could train to do pretty much anything and learn it super fast. Now, of course, we're never gonna be able to recreate those circumstances. We just have learned too much, we know too much. But what we can do is keep learning, keep trying new things. Maybe one day virtual reality will allow us to you know, immerse ourselves in completely alien worlds. But until then, we can just keep learning, keep taking on new challenges, keep exposing ourselves to new experiences, new environments. And as we do this, our brain will produce more of those chemicals. Our brain will become more plastic. And the more we learn and the more we use it, the more we'll be able to learn more and the more we'll be able to pick up new skills. So if you practice learning lots of things, exposing yourself to new things, especially learning new physical skills, the brain loves movement, your brain will become more awash in those chemicals, more malleable. Then you can practice those things I spoke about earlier, visualization training, ambidexterity, etc. And perhaps your brain will become a little more like Einstein's and you will learn to think a bit more like Einstein. But I'm not even saying that that's something you should want to do. Sure, Einstein was pretty genius, but who's to say that maths and spatial awareness are more valuable than other types of intelligence? What you need to do is not become more like Einstein, but become more like you, just the best version of you. So yeah, that was quite a nonsense rant, even by my standards. Most people aren't gonna go off and train their brain to be more like Einstein's, but I hope you found it interesting and useful, and maybe there's some nugget there that you can apply to your own life. It's certainly interesting to think about the different kinds of intelligence and how this is reflected by different structures in the brain and how we can maybe change those structures to change the way we think. If you did find it useful, or interesting then please leave a like down below it helps me a great deal maybe share the video with people leave a comment down below if you've got any questions or suggestions because i'd love to hear them i try and answer as many as i can um, check out the blog where i've uh, plugged many of my related posts or the other videos and yes yeah, stay tuned for more on the way more brain training neuroscience nootropics bodybuilding fitness productivity technology etc if that sounds good then i'll see you in the next one thanks very much for watching and Bye for now.